I stay appreciative. You know, I share all the time. You know, uh, share when I get the opportunity to go somewhere because I, I get moved to do it. You know, Sunday morning, all eyes on me. Everybody's looking at me. I do the spotlight work in Alcoholics Anonymous this morning. You know, and somebody out there new is probably thinking, damn, I can't wait till I'm in front of the group. <laughs> man to man, you know, because that's the kind of guy I am. I, you know, I'm ego, I'm flash, I'm image, I'm style over substance, all front, no back. You know, that, that's the kind of guy I am, you know. Um, that, that, and I like, you know, I like that. that. So you guys need to know the image guy is up in front of you today. Um, so the spotlight stuff is, is, is cool, you know, I, I kind of like it. But, you know, guys like this kind of remind me, you know, about what it is that we really do. In our fellowship, you know, we have a, we have a symbol, and that's a circle, you know, and inside that circle is a triangle. And that triangle, unity, recovery, and service, that's our three legacies. Unity is the fellowship. Uh, last night, Lynn talked about the fellowship, you know, in a way that moved me. I'm still a fellowship guy. I don't discount the power of the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've seen it in my life. You know, you'll hear something, and maybe you'll hear about a couple of things I've encountered. And this fellowship carried me for a moment, you know. Fellowship, and I bring my body to the fellowship. And I fell in love with the fellowship way before I even thought about the program. You know, so I brought my body to the fellowship. That's the unity. You know, then the recovery. And after I was here a minute, you know, why be in a 12-step program and not practice the 12 steps? And I got interested. I got excited and enthusiastic about our process of recovery. Took my mind to that, to that process, you know, and that's the second part. And then I took my recovered spirit and put it in the service. And if you want your recovery to go to another level, that's the one. That's the ticket. It's not the standing up in front of the group. You know, I call them the shadow soldiers, the people that work in the back. You know, the people like Tim, men like Mike Barnes, you know, men like Dick Cassidy. He took the time to come all the way to I don't take it lightly. A dude comes to the airport, picks me up, he takes out of his day. I know Dick's wife better than I know Dick. Uh, <laughs> and Dick is cool with that, you know, because uh, <laughs> that's the good news, you know. <laughs> Dick's wife carries a hell of a message, and C and I have shared some some podiums, and um, she's a good friend of mine, you know. So I, I thank thank Ellen for lending you to me this weekend, you know. Uh, the shadows of the people that did the registration, you know, the cats who were here, you know, doing the workshops, the volunteers who helped out, you know, put the programs, you know, and you in here right now. Don't worry about getting up in front. You the ones who get up on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night and you get the key and you open the door and you fire up the coffee pot and you wait for Ralph White to show up. You get up out of your warm beds and you go to our jails and you go to our institutions and you go to our treatment centers and you look for a guy like me. I don't care if it's Super Bowl Sunday. I don't care if it's NBA Finals. You have a commitment and you open up that door and you sit in that hall and you wait for me to show up. And I am forever grateful to the men you know, men like you to sit in this room, right? and with men and women who kept the light on for a drunk like me, had the opportunity to talk with a bunch of men in here this weekend. You know, I'm a, um, I'm a real life guy. I don't do this thing out of virtue, and I don't do it because it's the right thing to do. You know, I grew up as a church boy, and, you know, getting my reward later on never motivated me that much. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing it because I'm desperate, and I started doing it for, for my life, and I fell in love with it, you know. And really what I like at a gathering like this is there are many mentors for me. I've been on this road for a couple of summers, but I'm still wide open to being teachable, you know. Uh, I've had the opportunity now. My sponsor and I are separated by a whole lot of states, but we've had a lot of face-to-face -face time. We've been together three times in the last month, so we got a chance to spend some time together this weekend, spend some time with my good friend Charlie, you know, added some stuff to my men's list. I don't know. Charlie and I can't talk to you too much, Charlie. You know. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and guys, you know, I, I, let me get that out the way. And, and what I'm really impressed with, Mike, I'm really impressed because at conferences, when you go to conferences like this, 
you know, usually you get guys who are hungry for this deal. You get guys who've been in it for a minute, you know. You get guys who've been doing the deal. But, man, I'm impressed with the number of new guys. I'm impressed with the number of guys who just put got their feet put on a path to really go somewhere, who doing the deal at this level. It's one thing, you know, it's some essentials in recovery. First, get a sobriety date. If you don't have one, you don't have one. You know, get a sobriety date. Get a home group. Home group is something like a cheers for our new friends. It's a place where you go where everybody knows your name. You know. Get a home group. Get a sponsor. You know, get a sponsor. You know, and then there's another thing. Those are the essentials. I'm one of the ones who say something else. You know, get some road dogs. Make this thing fun. A sponsor is somebody, see, you're not going to hang with your sponsor. Your sponsor ain't going to be running with you. You know, he'll be guiding you along the path. But a road dog, those are the ones that you talk about your sponsor with. You know, you... <laughs> You know, your road dogs, you can talk about the girls and the rest of that because with your sponsor, you're on your best behavior. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not looking in the me, you know. But with your dog, you can, you know, you can get on that. So, and make it fun. Make it fun. I wouldn't have been on this road all these years if it hadn't have been fun for me. And so there are some things. That's not in the big book. You won't. So, guys, don't go looking for the road dog. Don't look for that in the big book. That's out of practical experience. I don't do it if it ain't fun. You know, I, I, I don't do it if it ain't fun. Yeah, you know, I'm serious about recovery, but I'm very seldom serious in recovery. If you ain't laughing in this program, you ain't taking this program serious enough. You know. uh, so, you know, new friends, uh, we did a countdown. And it's a bunch of, as well as the new guy, it's a bunch of people in here that's like, it's kind of intimidating. You know, um, Lynn stood up 47 years. He broke it down last night. I got to follow. I'm like, wow, you know. And, uh, and, and so, image guy, right? My inclination, let me, you know, break off some page line references for you guys. Let me do some quoting. Let me let you know I really am down with this. But I remember being new to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember standing up in a meeting somewhat like some of the guys did last night at the countdown. I remember them taking me to a meeting, and a guy was in front of the group somewhat like I am this morning. And he was dressed pretty nice, and his hair was combed, and his eyes were bright. He was stringing sentences together real well. I remember thinking to myself that night, I know this cat ain't been where I've been. I know he ain't felt what I felt. I know he ain't done what I've done. What can this lame tell me? So it's real important I let you know that the man that's standing in front of you this morning is not the same one that stumbled into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous October the 11th, 1986. I'm going to share with you in a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like today in the hopes that one of you new fellas will be thinking like I was thinking. Man, I used to do the same things. I used to feel the same way. Or more important, I, too, want to have this thing. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. I'm one of six boys. We stayed in a little two-bedroom apartment. Moms and pops stayed in one room. Six boys stayed in the other room in three bunk beds. Earliest memory of my old man was he was an alcoholic, and I didn't want to be like him. My father wasn't abusive, and my father wasn't violent. My father was an absentee drunk. And every other Friday, you knew he would show up, wouldn't show up with a check be a little kid in the neighborhood who would come around and inform my family how my old man had been performing up at the pool hall a previous Friday or Saturday night. And I feel ashamed and I feel embarrassed, and those are feelings I'm familiar with from a real early age. Pops got put out when I was eight or nine years old. Mom's proceeded to raise six boys by herself. Don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, ideal family life, ideal family life was taken from me from the TV programs at the day, of the day. I'll date myself. And I, in the programs that came on TV when I was a kid that showed ideal families, Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, Ozzy and Harriet, My Three Sons, Donna Reed, that, that wasn't jumping off in my house. You know, when you're grown, <laughs> when you're grown, you get something that's called perspective. And perspective works a little bit like this. You got a mom that essentially raised six boys by herself. Pops got put out when I was eight or nine. She raised six boys by herself. She was on welfare, refused to settle for that. You know, she put herself back through high school. She put herself through college. She worked two jobs. She took in clothes that she washed and ironed for other folk. And when you're grown, you look back on your life and say, damn, I had a hell of a mom. Look how she sacrificed to raise her boys. But when you're a kid about nine or ten years old, and you're coming home from school on a Wednesday afternoon with a couple of partners, 
and you hit the front door, and mom's is in the living room with an ironing board up and a rag on her head, you don't feel proud. You feel ashamed and embarrassed. And you stop bringing partners home from school. And if your name is Ralph, you start living in the prison I've lived in much of my life. And that's the prison of what I think you think about me. So I don't know what you think about me, but I'm trapped in what I think you think about me. And I will do whatever it takes to shape and form and mold your opinion of Ralph. I'll whine you, I'll dine you, I'll woo you, I'll cut, I'll bully you, I'll manipulate you, I'll buy you. Please like me. Now, I don't particularly have to like your ass, but please <laughs> like me. <laughs> Trapped in what I think you think about me. And to our new friends, you hear a lot of common themes in Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the themes you'll hear from most of our members when they get up here like this is, I never felt like I fit in. And that's not a part of my story. I'm a little guy. I like a lot of attention. I've never been interested in fitting in. I've always wanted to stand out. And as a result of that, I achieved and I accomplished some things. I don't want you guys to get confused about what we got going on. Somebody might be thinking to themselves, damn, I could see why he started drinking. Poor guy, hard to watch, grew up in poverty. I wouldn't have changed the way I grew up for nothing in the world. I'm the kid that went to, to sleep on Christmas Eve with all my clothes on because I couldn't wait for Christmas Day to come. I didn't know moms had 40 or $50 as a budget for her six boys. And we didn't get a lot. Chinese checkers, maybe Monopoly. I might get a glove or something this Christmas. But it was a lot of love in my house. It was cooking, and it was smells, and it was singing, and it was family. And it was, you know, and it was playing in the streets and playing, but throwing the ball, you know, and I wouldn't change the way I grew up for nothing in the world. When I was a kid, I never knew a lonely moment. I got six, I got five brothers. Baseball was my game. You know, me and my brothers made up the whole infield. One of my brothers played left field. You know, <laughs> you, know uh, you could play ball in the streets in those days, man. I grew up in the streets. It was a changing time. It was a turbulent time. I was caught up in that. I was going to make a difference in my community. I was going to be somebody. You know, uh, I wouldn't have changed the way I grew up in the world. So this morning, you know, the speaker you out this morning, and I here to report to you today that I'm an alcoholic because I grew up and we didn't have no money. Somebody in here grew up with a silver spoon. I'm not here to report to you tonight, this morning that I'm an alcoholic because I'm a product of a broken home. Somebody in here grew up with both parents. I'm not here to report to you this morning that I'm an alcoholic because I'm a poor brother from the hood. Look around the room. You know that ain't the reason. You know? <laughs> I'm not here to report to you this morning that I'm an alcoholic because I'm a little guy. There's plenty of big guys in this room. I'm an alcoholic for two reasons and two reasons only. One, when I take one, I can't tell you when I'm going to stop. Two, when I sincerely don't want to start that cycle again, I start it again anyway. I'm bodily and mentally different. That's it. That's all. The rest is my story. My story goes a little bit like this. Every single one of you had me in your classroom. I was usually the class president or student body president. I was a straight-A student. I was teacher's pet. I played ball. I made all-stars. On the outside, I should have been okay. On the inside, I've always felt like if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Yeah, I was teacher's pet. Yeah, I was straight A student. Would have traded it all in if I could have been cool. If I just could have been cool. Because in my neighborhood, it was a whole lot more currency placed on cool than on smart. You know, yeah, you know, because the cats who was cool, I see you. Some of you in here right now. You know, I see you, Charlie. You know, they were, they were the ones. You know, the ones in the bathroom, smoking cigarettes, shooting dice, taking quarters from guys like me that brought extra quarters with them, right? And, and you knew how to talk to girls. And girls were a mystery to me. You know, check this out, dude. I've always felt like the rest of you guys had a handle on this manhood thing I just didn't get. I don't know if it was because Pops was gone all the time and I didn't have nobody to give it, but I always felt like you guys knew something about this manhood thing. I just didn't know. Thirteen years old, Cass would be talking about throwing down with girls already. I'd be like, man, what happened to me? I didn't know you was lying, but you know what? <laughs> Thank you.
talking about it already, man. Later on in life, right? Because the, the way I rolled, you know, I had some good times drinking. Later on in life, I, I'd be rolling because I, I, I did a lot of clubbing, you know, and I'd be rolling with my crew. And then my crew of dudes, it would always be a couple of pretty boys, right, guys who, you know, who could get girls come to me. And then we'd be at the club, and my boy would have a, he'd have a girl in the corner, and, and he'd be over there, and, and, and he'd have her giggling. I'm here hustling because I want to know, what do you say to have a girl giggle? I didn't have that in me, right? And so I'm growing up, and I'm shy, and I'm introverted, you know. I'm a late bloomer. So, you know, sometimes I used to, when I first started talking, I'd be like, Am I, should I really be sharing an Alcoholics Anonymous? Because my story seemed like a little poop of a story because I'm, I'm a late bloomer in AA, you know. Um, this is the first place I came where folk try to outbottom each other, right? I, I never <laughs> <laughs> my home group at home, you know, my first home group, 9604 South Figueroa. If you ever come to L.A., Figueroa is the stroll. There's working girls on Figueroa, and it's right in the hood, you know. And my home group over there, when I first started going, cats would be up at the podium, and they share those stories, man. And I got, to, I got hooked on the stories. And I wanted a penitentiary story with I'll visit in the pen to get it. Because right? <laughs> in the A, you guys started drinking eight years old, you know, drinking your kid and your parents' stuff at parties. Pops got put, I never saw active alcoholism in my house. My father, when he was there, he drank away from home. He got put out when I was pretty young. My mother never touched alcohol. So I experienced the effects of alcoholism, but I never witnessed out active alcoholism in my house, right? So I'm, I'm a, to me, I'm a latecomer to this game. You know, I'm, I'm 16 years old, you know, and I'm square. I'm a schoolboy. Me and my two brothers right under me, we were schoolboys, man. We carried books. We were straight-A students. We were like that. And I'm 16 years old. I ain't touched nothing. You know, haven't touched. And I'm not going, I'm not going to be my daddy. So 16, I get a girlfriend. Now, check this out. Ralph with a girlfriend ain't the same thing as it means for some of you cats. Ralph with a girlfriend in 16 simply means this. I ran with a crew of dudes that went with the same group of girls. One of my boys broke up with this girl. I waited a little time in the past, told my other boy, look, I want to go with her. He came back and told me. She said, yes, now I got a girlfriend. <laughs> Don't do girls, though. <laughs> this is my official girlfriend, right? This one, if you ask her who you go with, she say, Ralph. You know, I, I had other girlfriends before, but this one actually knew she was my, my girlfriend. <laughs> Remember them old rotary phones? You know, some of you old veterans and youngsters are like, what are you talking about? You know, uh, the old rotary phone, I call my girl. That seventh number would go around and seem like it would come back in slow motion. You know, terror would set in. You got to talk. It's the phone, right? I just hang up on my girl. Clear. This particular night, I'm out on a double date. Me and, uh, me and my girl in the back seat, older partner of mine and his girl in the front seat, he driving. Plastic cup of rum and coke, come to the back seat this particular night, drank that rum and coke down, went down real warm, rushed back to the top of my brain. All of a sudden, Ralph's hands started doing things they had never done. Mouth started saying things that had never said I had arrived. Alcohol did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Gave me the courage to do and to be and to say things I wouldn't do, be and say without it, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about me in lots of places, and it starts in the front, doctor's opinion. There's a line in there that jumped out at me the first time I saw it. Men and women like me drink essentially for the effect produced by alcohol. First time I saw that, I recognized it because that's why I drank. I'm not overnight alcoholic. I understand we talk about this disease being progressive in nature because that's how it showed up in my experience. That first time I drank, I didn't get pissy drunk. I didn't make a fool out of myself. I didn't throw up. You know, I got a warm, tipsy feeling. I kissed and licked and sucked on my girl in some places I had never done before. You know. <laughs> and that's how my alcoholism stayed. I would drink to go out and party on the weekends. 71, I graduated from high school and I graduated to higher education in every sense of the word. I started college and in 71, my drinking was still just on weekends. By 1972, my drinking had now gone to not only on weekends, but during the day of the weekend to get ready for the party that night. By the end of 72, I'm drinking and I'm now my drinking has started creeping up to during the week. And now I've added some non-addictive marijuana to the mix. By 
73, I'm drinking, I'm smoking, I'm selling herb, I'm doing other drugs, I'm doing it on a daily basis, couldn't have told me there was anything wrong with the way I was living. The big book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about at a certain point in my drinking career, I won't be able to tell the truth from the false, and the way that that worked for me is this, in the way that I'm doing it, isn't that the way that everybody does it, why would you be young? with a bright future, with a little bit of money. I was getting financial aid. Didn't chase some women and get low to come with the territory. In those days, man, if you came over my house and I couldn't offer you something to drink or something to smoke, I wouldn't be in a good house. And if I went over your house and you didn't do the same for me, not only weren't you being a good host, wasn't coming over your house no more. <laughs> <laughs> for what? <laughs> wasn't nothing to discuss. You know, and um, no disrespect to our young friends. I don't mean new friends. I mean young friends. I'm glad I grew up in the era I grew up in. I'm glad I came up at the time I came up. You know, the 70s, the early 70s, late 60s, it was a turbulent time. It was a change in time in this country. And in some ways, in some areas, it seemed a simpler time. In 2012, you worry about safe sex, AIDS, sexually transmitted stuff. So, man, back in those days, I'd go to a club, I'd have a one-question interview for a girl. You get high? If not, next. I don't need to know your last name. I don't need to know, don't need to know your sign. I don't need to know none of that. Let's get to the basis of this relationship. Are you doing it the way that I'm doing it, you know? And that's just the way that I was living, you know? I, I came to the program. I'm going to go over here for a minute. Somebody bring me back if I get stuck. You know, I came to the program four times before I came to stay, you know? And the early attempts at this program, you know, my, my deal would be this. I'm a good mimic, and I'm a good chameleon. You know, and my deal would be I go to a meeting, somewhat like we are this morning. I listen to the speaker share. I pick out what in my ears were the most profound things he said. I go to a meeting tomorrow night, make sure the speaker's not there, not too many of you guys. I repeat what the speaker said. I tack on a keep coming back, and the program works. And I thought if I claimed it from the podium, it would be true in my experience. And I kept getting loaded, kept getting loaded. Kept getting loaded. There are lots of paradoxes in the program Alcoholics Anonymous, and there are lots of thin lines. First time I heard surrender to win. What the hell are you talking about? Quitters don't win. If you ever play ball, that's the hardest concept to, concept to wrap your head around, fellas, right? You don't give up. You don't quit. That's a man thing. That ain't something that we do. You know, and there are some other thin lines in this program. And they're the thinnest of lines, but they make all the difference. And there's a thin line between comparing and identifying. And I would always compare, and I could never identify. And I couldn't find myself in the big book, I'll call it synonymous, and I couldn't find myself in any of you guys' stories. One of the reasons why the process of identification is so important for us, you know, if I'm going to win the confidence of anybody else. So I would be sitting in the meetings, and, and somebody, I would read the big book, I'll call it synonymous, and I would read Bill's story. You know, and I, and I find all the differences. You know, Bill is an older white guy. Don't have that in common. You know, uh, I read a little bit further. Bill was a veteran of foreign wars. I'm a Vietnam era draft dodger. You know, and Bill's story, you know, Bill was a Wall Street stockbroker. Check out the way I handle money. You know, we don't have that in common. You know. Bill, in his story, if you read into it, there's a part in there where he talks about there had been no real infidelity. Miss me on that one, too. You know, so I always found all the differences. And I do the same thing when I listen to you guys share from the podium. I find all the differences. And when I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous, the state, it's fourth time, somebody taught me how to read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, Ralph, the same way that you read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous is the same way that you listen to our members share when they get up in front of the group. When you read the big book Alcoholics Anonymous and when you listen to our members share their stories, ask yourself three or four questions. Ask yourself, did I drink like he drank? Did I think like he thought? Did I feel like he felt? Or did I do what he did? And when I read Bill's story in the light of those questions, I found my story. I was at this major university, and just like him, the drive for success was on. I proved to the world I was important. Just like he started saying in his story, drink started taking a more important and exhilarating part in my life. Just like it. He went on to say something like this. Bill said, out of this alloy of drink and speculation, 
he would later forge a weapon that would turn on him like a river. Out of this combination of his drinking and his thinking, he would later forge a weapon that would turn on him like a boomerang and cut him to ribbon. I don't talk like that. That's what he do. My grandmother had a shortcut way of putting that. She used to say, trouble always start out like fun. You know? <laughs> And you couldn't have told me when I'm on the front end. I'm just drinking what youngsters drink. You couldn't have told me whether I'm drinking some Spinata, Annie Green Spring, Boone's Farm. Up in the dorms, you know, we'd have a lot of fellas pitch in and, you know, a whole bunch of money for this damn red mountain. You know, you get a gallon for about 39 cents. You know, uh, <laughs> you couldn't have told me. You couldn't have told me, man, innocent drinker. You couldn't have told me where this was going to take me, you know, but it took me, you know, and somehow I made it through school, you know, and, 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 and I'm at this major university. Talk about the drive for success was on. I proved the world I was important. And you couldn't have told me it was going to take me on this ride because check it out. This is how I'm rolling. I'm at, a, I'm, I'm at a place and I'm rolling with cats who were going to be playing on Sundays on TV. You know, they were going to be playing in the association during the week. I'm rolling with people who were going to be political leaders in my town and in my state and in this country. I'm rolling with people who were going to be captains of industry in this country, and I'm right with them. I'm going to be one of them, too. You know, so you couldn't have told me on the front end, this is where it was going to take me. So I'm, I'm, I'm out here at this university. I'm doing the deal, man. We get loaded 1,000 and, and having big fun. You know, I somehow I make it through school, and I get out, and I start working. Now, even though I had the kind of job that should have allowed me to acquire what normal people did, I never did that. I never did. A snapshot of Ralph's life, this is when alcohol was working. I'd buy a car. I'd make exactly three car payments, then come find it. I'm fine. First time out of car repossessed, I had the nerve to call LAPD. You know, I'm nine. You know, I'm nine months behind on the car note, right? I call LAPD. I want to report a stolen car. They do whatever they do. No, their rightful owner just came and picked their stuff up. Next two times, I didn't even trip. I already knew. You know, I'm the kind of brother never had a problem balancing a bank book. Payday, I got money. Two days later, broke. Zero. No problem balancing my bank. Book. <laughs> Stayed in the career from 1976 to 1979 without paying rent. A couple of baffling features about the disease I suffer from, and one of them is this. I can't see my relationship with alcohol until I'm free of it. I can't see what it's doing to me when I'm in the mix. So some of the things that are crystal clear to me now, looking back in the rearview mirror of experience, were not at all clear to me when I was going through them. One fact stands out real clear to me about the days when I thought alcohol was working. I used to go to work for two weeks to live for two days. That's it. That's all. And I can't tell you the day or the hour. I can't tell you where I was, what I was doing. I can't tell you, you know, exactly what time it was or what, what year it was or where I was when alcohol ceased to be a luxury for me and became a necessity. I can't tell you that it did happen. You know, and I'm one of the ones that plays the regret game in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm one of the ones that sits in the rooms and say to myself, you know how the regret game goes? If I only knew then what I know now, I never would have took that year right. Remind me of a story I like to tell when I get a chance. A story about a little boy named Johnny. Johnny had a habit. His father used to frown on Johnny. He used to play with himself. Father goes to work, comes home real early. Bedroom door is closed. Father opens the door without knocking. Sure enough, little Johnny's in the bedroom masturbating. Father looks at him and says, son, I thought I told you if you keep doing that, you'll go blind. Little Johnny looked at his daddy and said, well, daddy, can I just do it till I need glasses? You know, <laughs> I like that story because it reminds me of me and the life. I see you going down, you going down, you go, I'm just going to do it till I need glass. And the book talks about seeking the Lord companion. It wasn't long before I became the Lord companion, and we don't have enough time for me to tell you all the things that should have been signs along the way. I got married on a Saturday afternoon in April of 1980. I had a bachelor party the night before my wedding. None of the guys at the bachelor party are getting married the next day. All of them have sense enough to go home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm still at my bachelor party till 7.30, me and my brother. They take me home at 7.30, pour me in the bed, get me up at 10 o'clock for my 1 o'clock wedding. I'm supposed to say my own vows at this wedding. You know, I stagger in, you know, that I barely, I'm up, man, that 10 o'clock, I didn't, I didn't go to sleep. I just laid on the bed, you know, I'm toe up. 
You know, one of them nights where the bed is rotating and you earling and you throwing up stomach line and ain't nothing left to go. You know, I'm one of those nights. And so I wobble into the thing, and my then wife to be took one look at me and she looked at the preacher. She said, "Okay, scratch the on vow, set a regular on his ass." So now my lines are cut to two words, and we get into the ceremony. It gets to me. I get ready to say, "I said I threw up all over." <laughs> <laughs> have not taken a wedding picture to this day. <laughs> Pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. New friends, if you're anything like me, when I first hit the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, the words you guys used in the room were not unfamiliar to me, but the way you guys used them was not the way I used them in my everyday walk around vocabulary. You guys were talking about a psychic change and a phenomena of craving. You're talking about an allergy of the body. First time I heard you guys talk about all those, I needed some help with them. But the first time I heard pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, didn't need no help with that one. Folk like us don't need a dictionary for pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I lived pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization up close and personal. And I lived it over and over and over and over again. See, I'm the kind of father and I'm the kind of husband. Remember sitting on my living room couch. Wife coming out the bathroom real fast, pulling her pants up. Going to the dining room table, picking her purse up off that table, clutching it real close to her. She went back to the bathroom. And I feel as tall because nobody was in the house but me and her, but it got like that in my house. I'm the kind of father and I'm the kind of husband member coming home, sticking my key in the door. Wife and two-year-old daughter sitting right there and they're crying. Look over here and homeboy sitting in my seat with a gun pointing at my stomach talking about I want my money right now. Fellas, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I always had a lot of fears and a lot of doubts about, do I have what it takes to be a father? Do I have what it takes to be a husband? Because if you're in the life, your track record already gives you an answer, right? Because what's the father's role and what's the husband's role? To protect and to provide, and it's a cold-blooded feeling, fellas. Laying in bed with a woman night after night after night after night, knowing not only aren't you protecting, knowing not only aren't you providing, you're the one bringing the wolf to the door. See, they came up in my house several times. Each time I pretended to call LAPD, each time I knew I was playing a game because they had told me, you're going to give us our money or we're going to come up in here and get it. I'm the kind of father and I'm the kind of husband I remember coming home, sitting on my back porch, two-year-old daughter coming outside pulling at my coat. Daddy, daddy, that's my piggy bank. I remember stopping and giving her a little grin. Don't worry, baby. Daddy's going to put some dollar bills in here for this change. And I wasn't ready to be stealing from my daughter. And I wasn't ready to be stealing from my wife. I was an alcoholic with no tools of recovery. And I did what it took to get what I needed to get. I've shared with you that my disease is progressive in nature. And in my experience, it's progressive in a couple of areas. I share one area already takes more than it used to take in order for me to get the same effect. But my disease is progressive in another area, my behavior. My behavior gets progressively worse. I'm willing to do more, more readily, chase this thing. First time I hit my wife's purse, if you would hook me up to a polygraph, I would have passed when I told you I'm not stealing this money. I'm going to take this $30 and I'm going to replace it before she knows it's missing. And I meant it. I meant it. You know, I um, had the opportunity last week to be in Akron, the birthplace of this deal. I'm a student of the deal, and I'm, I'm forever grateful. And I still trip off how close and how much had to happen for you and me to be here this morning. December of 1934, dude was in the hospital for the fourth time. <coughs> same doctor, same dude. The month before, he had been visited by a friend of his, put him down with some information he had got from the Oxford group. Something happened to Bill Wilson that December in 1934 in Towns Hospital. He couldn't explain it, doctor couldn't explain it, but it was so profound 
from the outside looking in, the doctor looked at the dude and said, man, I don't know what you, this is, but I think you need to hold on to it. And he left that hospital. And when he went out for the next six months looking for men like you and me, wasn't successful, but in that time period, some of his boys put together business opportunities, sent him out to Akron, Ohio. Business didn't come off too well, and he found himself on a hotel in the hotel lobby. And in that, that Sunday afternoon in that hotel lobby, he got thirsty. And he's standing in the lobby, and you could see the bar from the lobby. He could probably hear the ice clinking in the glasses. And he had a novel thought that entered his head. First time thought. I trip off that. Why would this thing? And he said, I need to find a drunk not to drink. Amazing series of what seem to be coincidences. It's only when you look back that you can see the finger of God. When you end God's will, you don't when you in the middle of grace and when you in the middle of big things, you don't know you're in the middle of that. You just a desperate guy that don't want to drink, that's thirsty. You know, so he's looking and he gets these phone numbers and he's directed to this minister who directs him to this lady and this lady knew a lady who had a husband who was drinking. And Bill Wilson put a call in Henrietta Cyberland and called Ann Smith. I understand you got a husband that's in trouble. And uh, Ann Smith looked at her drunk husband and dude said, man, I can't talk to nobody today. Tell him we'll come through tomorrow. I give him 15 minutes. And they met at the gatehouse with Henrietta, Henrietta Cyberling's residence. And Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith met, and that 15 minutes turned into six hours. And in a couple of years, those two gentlemen while looking for guys like us. About 40 people were staying sober. Imagine that. And I like to think that that New York hustler looked at that Akron physician and must have said, how are we going to let Ralph White know when it's his time? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, we'll put it in a book. And they put me in that book. I get chills when they put me in that book. That book was published in 1939. I hit this earth in 1953, and I found you guys in 1986, and they put me in that book. Two weeks after I said I'm going to replace this money before my wife knows it's missing, right, because I took the money, went out, spent it up, came back looking for some more. She had moved the purse. I didn't even trip. I'm going to replace it before she knows it's missing. Two weeks later, I'm out doing the same thing, same scenario presented, spent up all my money, Came back looking for some more money. And the idea of replacing the money didn't even come to mind. They got a part, you know, there's a part in the book that describes me to a T. It says, we don't know why. Alcoholic could be unable to recall with sufficient force. Pain, suffering, humiliation, weeks, even days ago. And that idea of replacing the money didn't come to mind. Got replaced by a new thought. I said, last time I took 40, came back looking for the purse to find some other, and she had moved it. This time I'll take all the money out the purse, and that that I don't spend up, I'll sneak it back in the purse. You know? <laughs> I was off and running to hit my wife's purse on a regular. I might do it on a Wednesday, come back on a Monday. I did it one too many Wednesdays, came back Monday. Screen door was locked, note on the door. The rest of your stuff is at your mama's house. I'm put out of my house. I'm now my daddy. And over the course of that next year, my five brothers got put out their respective homes. We ended up at my mom's house, and we damn near killed her. When I first got put out of my mom's house and went to stay, when I first got put out of my house and went to stay at my mom's house, my ex-wife thought it was something salvageable about this piece of man she married. And she used to bring my daughter over to my mother's house on Saturdays so we could keep a father-daughter relationship. And I wanted to be a father to my little girl with everything in me. I really, really, really did. I wanted to take my girl to Disneyland and Magic Mountain. I wanted to take her to a movie on a Saturday afternoon. I wanted to walk up the street with her little hand in my big hand, take her to the store and buy her ice cream. I wanted to sit her in my lap and read stories to her. I wanted to tuck her in bed at night and get a good night kiss. I wanted to get the look from my little girl that I've seen men in this fellowship get, to look like this is my daddy and this is my hero. And the best I could do on those Saturday afternoons was 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Tell my mom something like I'm going to the store to buy a rain some ice cream, I disappear. Sneak back on Sunday when she was picking her up, when her mom was picking her up. I could still remember, man, some of those long Sunday nights sticking my head around the side of my mom's house, tears flowing, flowing. 
and I see those two heads in the car and the headlights backing out the driveway and through the tears I'd be thinking, there goes my life backing out this driveway. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I've heard a lot of people share about being scared of dying out there. I was never scared of dying. I was scared I was going to keep waking up to the same old thing. Monday the same as Tuesday, the same as Sunday, the same as Christmas, over and over and over again. And I'm so glad God don't make misery comfortable. And on October 11, 1986, I got miserable enough and I got tired enough, I got directed to my fourth program of recovery. They took me to the Harbor Life Center on Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. Two days after, they took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. That October in 1986, I was in a real bad way. I was full of remorse and I was full of regret and I was full of I'll never be able to forgive myself for the things I had done and what I had become. I've only shared with you the tip of the iceberg. I didn't share with you when I got put out of my house and went to stay at my mom's house. I started stealing on my mom's purse. I didn't share with you when I got put out of my house and went to stay at my mom's house. Check came to one of my little brothers in the name R. White. All of us are R. White. Took that. Didn't share with you when I got put out of my house and went to stay at my mom's house. My grandmother gave me $200 to buy a plane ticket to the family reunion. If it wasn't for my mom, my grandmother never would have saw Atlanta, Georgia. Didn't share with you the first time I tried to get sober. My ex-wife got me a job at her job, stole $1,600 from them, ruined her reputation in that industry. Didn't share with you a lot. Suffice it to say I had a lot on my tip when I came. And I was full I'd never be able to forgive myself for the things I had done, what I had become. They took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and a gentleman was standing up in front of the group, somewhat like I am this morning. And he was sharing about taking from the job, and he was sharing about taking from the family. And I remember looking at him and thinking to myself, yeah, you're sharing about doing scandalous things, but you look scandalous. You should have been doing that. I'm <laughs> I'm different. Y'all ain't going to hear my business. And the speaker seemed like he knew I was in the room. He was reading my mail, man. He dropped something on me like this. He said, if you're sitting in this room right now, you are not responsible for your disease, but you are responsible for your recovery. And you have just now tapped into a source of power much greater than yourself. And you don't have to drink and you don't have to use no matter what, provided you are willing to fulfill some conditions. And that speaker that night went on to say, this is the only club you can be a member of where the worse off you are when you get here, better off your chances of staying. And I got the message of hope at the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous they took me to. He described to me what I suffer from, and he did it in a strange way. Cat was talking about me, talking about himself. Had never seen anything like it. A lot of people had been talking at me, about me, around me, down to me. This cat was talking about me, talking about myself. Hit me where I live. He said that, he, that he, and he described to me what I suffer from. That it's something physically different about me than other folk. And it seemed like in the condition I was in, we call it Sweetie Reed, seemed like he had invited me to diagnose myself. Ralph, don't take my word for it. There's something bodily different about me. How many times did you say I'm just going to spend 20? What happened? Whole paycheck. How many times did you say I'm going to stop off at happy hour for a minute? What happened? Whole paycheck. How many times did you say I'm going to stop off over here at my boy my, uh, Bob's house for a minute? What happened? Whole paycheck. Ralph, did it happen once? Did it happen twice? If your name is Ralph from 1979 to 1985, every two weeks, whole paycheck. My experience, not yours, not my sponsors, not any man in here. My experience abundantly confirms for me when I take one or anything, no matter where I have to go, what I have to do, who I have to see, no matter how great the wish or the necessity, my body takes over and I have to have another. Okay, smart guy, if it's just my body, how do you explain stone sober, my car seemed to drive to the LIQ on payday? <laughs> Second part of this disease, the mental obsession, the obsession that somehow, someday, I will be able to control and enjoy that magic potion I discovered all those many years ago. Somebody help me. Where the hell is that coming from? Control and enjoy. Check this out. Anytime I was controlling, I wasn't enjoying. Anytime I was enjoying, I damn sure wasn't controlling. Why am I stuck on control and enjoy? I can't drink because of my body. I can't not because my mind refuses to accept that fact I'm powerless. Third part is disease, the spiritual malady. 12 and 12 describes it as a soul sickness. And in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says, Ralph, if you work on the spiritual, the mental, and the physical will straighten out. That's what we do. That's what we do. Anybody in here that's new should probably start squirming. I did. Getting ready. <laughs> Getting ready to roll the G word out. I feel it. <laughs> 
Yeah, dude, you can talk about creative intelligence, spirit of the universe, higher power. You can't fool me. You know, I was marched to church from the time I could walk. My mother marched her six boys to church every Sunday morning. We went to Sunday school. We went to church. We ate the evening service. We ate dinner at church. We went to PT. We went to choir. I said, when I turn 16 years old, you never have to worry about Ralph White darkening the doors of anybody else's church. Said it, did it, meant it. I'm a product of the 60s, and in those days, we used to say religion is an opiate of the people. I'd rather smoke mine. Thank you very much. You know, and that's that, saying little catchy things, like, but I meant it, man. I was violently anti-religious. You know, my grandparents were raised in church. That's cool for y'all, grandma, my granny, you know. Yeah, that's cool for you. You need to be in church, y'all, you know. You're not as bright as me. You're not as sharp as me. You're not as slick as me. You're not as educated as me. You know, all those things that that was. So the G word, man, and I'm like, here they go. They're getting ready to come with it. You know, work on the spiritual, the mental, and the physical astray. Now, here it comes. You know, and if you're sitting in here right now and you're squirming, I understand. You're sitting in here and you're looking at a guy standing in front and he's 25 years sober. He got a, yeah, dude, that's easy for you. You can talk about God and you can talk about the things he's done in your life. You don't understand me. That stuff is easy. Check this out. I did not come up in here walking toward the light. I came up in here running from the fire. And if your ass is on fire, you is a good place for you to. <laughs> not why I came. I came up in here on the negative second step. I come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I've been living, living it. I didn't come up in here looking for God. I didn't come up in here looking for a spiritual experience. I didn't come up, I came up in here with something chasing me, something that I couldn't outrun. I couldn't, the book talks about, you know, crushed by a self-imposed crisis. I could no longer avoid or evade. Now, you know, man, my, you know, so if you in here, you know, and we ain't here to convince nobody to stop drinking. You know, with some new friends that stood up, it was a guy that stood up with 24 hours. We're not here to convince nobody to stop drinking. We want you when alcohol is through with you. I'm not the speaker that's the doom and gloom speaker. I'm not the speaker that tries to scare you in the recovery. I'm not the speaker that's going to tell you, oh, if you go back out there, it's still kicking in. You know, that ain't my mess. You know, if you listen to my story and you could read between the lines, you could hear it. You know, sometime in what I used to think of as my heyday, people used to look at the way I was doing it and be like, damn, Ralph, ain't you scared of overdose? I'll be like, scared of overdose? I'm scared of the deadly underdose. You better put some more up on here. You know? So the message that you know, the message that will attract an alcoholic of my variety, you know, book talks about a message that's got to have depth and it's got to have weight. And the message this morning speaker brings to you that's got the most depth and the most weight, you're looking at a guy who is 33 years old and giving up on life. You're looking at a guy who is 33 years old did not know where his little girl was enrolled in school and didn't know where his family was living. You're looking at a guy who is 33 years old had not answered anybody's 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock wake-up call to go to work in so long, I no longer thought I was employable. You're looking at a guy who came from a major university in this country, and my job at the end was taking the trash out for a 21-year-old. I was sleeping in the back of my mother's garage, and I was eating lemons off a neighbor's lemon tree for breakfast. And the men and women in this fellowship, the fellowship I craved, you met me where I was. You nursed me, and you loved me back to health. You gave me a way out, a way out upon which we all agree. You put my feet on a path to really go somewhere. You put my, and, and man, I am forever grateful to that. I'm still grateful. 25 plus years later, I'm as grateful as the day I came up in here. You know, if you're sitting in this room right now and you think this program is just about not drinking and just about not using, you're shortchanging the program, shortchanging yourself. I'm not knocking physical sobriety, don't get me wrong. If you just don't drink and you just don't use, you might make it home with a whole paycheck. If you just don't drink and you just don't use, you might stop going to jail on the weekends. If you just don't drink and you just don't use, you might make it to work on Monday morning. But what this program has to offer is a whole lot more than that. What this program is really about is about obtaining and maintaining access to a source of power that does for me what I can't do for myself. What this program is really about is about obtaining and maintaining access to a source of power that can do anything but fail. This program is really about you want to put a face on it. 
We heard a lot of talking this weekend. We do a lot of talking about the process of recording. We do a lot of talking about the steps that lead to this power. But what this program is really about, Alcoholics Anonymous ain't limited like that. God ain't limited to 164. God ain't contained within the pages of a book. You can God, and God is, if God is small enough for me to understand, he wouldn't be big enough for me to trust. I, I don't even trip off that. You know, what the program Alcoholics Anonymous is about, it's, it's vital. It's alive. It is, you know, it's dynamic. It is not just some steps on a wall. It's got, it, it, it's got broad shoulders, and it's got arms, and it's got a beating heart. You know what the program Alcoholics Anonymous is about. And you want to see the program Alcoholics Anonymous? You want to see it? Fellas, take a look around this room right now. What this program is really about is about taking people like us. Drunks and boosters and convicts and con artists, tricks, failures as parents, failures as kids, failures as, as fathers, broken down pieces of, of men and women who don't have dreams and goals and hopes anymore. And this program puts us together in one room. And I stick one hand in your hand, another hand in God's hand. And we pick up our beds and we walk up out of these rooms. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, employees, employers, role models in our community. This program is about growth. This program is about change. If it's going to be any changes made in my life, it begins and it ends with me. I stand in front of you guys this morning as an advocate for the steps of recovery, as an advocate for the process of recovery that's outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, as an advocate for strong sponsorship, you know, as an advocate for going to meets, as an advocate for the whole deal. And the only reason I stand up in front of you is not because it's what people do when they get up in front of the group. It's not because it's what everybody else says when they get up in front of you. You found me, and I signed up for the duty, October 11, 1986. And you found me in a real bad way. And you found me in a real bad condition. And this morning, instead of really just talking about the process, I want to talk about my fellowship, and I want to talk about what's happened for me since I've been in here these past 25 years. Because, fellas, I do this thing for real. I don't do it like it's homework. I don't do it because when I get the chance to stand in front of you guys, I get to impress you with my knowledge of the book. I don't do it because I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to dazzle you. I do it because I'm a grown-ass man in my life for the first time in my life. I'm going to share with you the benefits of putting your feet on a path. I'm going to share with you the benefits of really listening to what it is. Do you, I'm going to talk to the new man for a minute. Don't get mad at me, old-timers. I am extremely indebted. I'm a guy. You know how many fathers we got in here? We got a lot of fathers in here. One of the things that I try to teach my kids, and I'm sure most of the fathers in here try to teach, is there's value. There is value in respecting you. You don't even have to know what it is You don't, because you don't know where they've been. You don't know what they've been through. Dude, you don't even have to know them. You see an adult, you just give them respect. You're going to be an adult one day, and you're going to know why. New friends, you see old time, you give them respect. Where I come from in my home group, I, I had hit the place where most of them, I'm going to just talk about some real stuff for a minute. Don't ask me why I'm going there, but I'm going to go there. I'm just, we just talking this morning, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to just talk about some real stuff in my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to talk to some of our new friends. It's something you got to bring to the table that can't nobody else bring. All the guys that stood up is fairly new. And it's new in order to get recovery, and it's new in order to stay recovered. It's one thing i got to bring to the table. My sponsor can't bring it. None of the other guys in here can bring it. Bill Wilson could come out the brave. He couldn't bring it to me. He couldn't give it to me. There's one thing i got to bring to the table, and that's desire. That's willingness i got to bring willingness to the table. Ralph, I've been trying this thing six times. I can't seem to find the willingness. I can't seem to find it. How do I get it? I don't know but one way to get it. Well, whoop the ass. <laughs> you don't get talked into it. You don't get browbeat into it. Sponsor, stop doing that. Stop doing that. And I'm so boxing. But just stop doing that. 
You know, I want you. I've been doing this now, and, and sponsorship is is kind of like parenting. You know, Charlie did a deal just on working with us, and I love what he was doing yesterday because sponsorship is like parenting. Cats be sitting up in here, and you you know, if somebody step to you and talk about, you know, hey man, would you sponsor? They see something in you. I see something in you. I have people come to me well-intentioned and well-meaning. Ralph, I'm not ready to sponsor yet. You know, I need to tell this guy. That's what you're telling him. You're telling him because I'm selfish and self-centered, so I see everything from me, even well-intentioned. And so I'm telling him, dude, I'm not ready. What he's hearing is no. What he's hearing is rejection. How I got my sponsor, my first sponsor, I'm at a meeting, right? I'm six, I, I'm, I'm doing the deal. I'm about 90 days, 100 days, and I go to a meeting, speaker meeting. You know, and I'm at the meeting, and I'm sitting there doing this newcomer thing. It had a break, and I wouldn't go get coffee because I was scared if I got coffee, I would stumble, and everybody would look at me and laugh. So I'm thinking everybody looking at me. And at the same time, I'm sitting in that seat right about where Charlie is, and I wouldn't get up, and I'm thinking nobody knows I'm there. I'm thinking everybody's looking at me, and nobody knows I'm there. Newcomers, we understand that kind of confusion. And I'm thinking that, and dude that was leading the meeting was a guy that had been around a lot. I had been watching him, and his deportment shouted out he was a man. Everybody knew him. When he talked, the room got quiet. And he came to me, and he stuck his hand out, and he asked me my name. And I shook his hand, and I can't tell you what happened at the meeting. But at the end of the meeting, he said, after a moment of silence for the alcoholic who still suffers, I want my new friend, Ralph. And somebody knew my name in Alcoholics Anonymous. I started rolling with dude. He would put me in the car. We'd go everywhere. I didn't have it in me to ask him to sponsor me because I didn't know anything about this altruistic movement. I don't know nothing about something for nothing. Where I come from, it's all you know. It's tit for tat. I, I, I don't know nothing about something for nothing. So I'm rolling with dude, and uh, I want to ask him to sponsor me, but I just can't stand him. No, I, I, I can't stand it. You know, and so I say, one day we're rolling, and I say, this is safe. I said, uh, you know I consider you my sponsor. <laughs> and me and Bob Hunt got started on this path. I learned some indispensable things. If you think this whole deal is just about the acquisition of knowledge and information, you're missing it, fellas. You're missing it. I suffer from an, I suffer from an illness that only a spiritual experience can conquer, and that's what I've been after. And that's what I continue to be after. The trick of the deal is I don't know what a spiritual experience looks like, and I think I do. I think a spiritual experience looks like I'm going to be square. I think a spiritual experience looks like, okay, no more sex, no more freaky sex for sure. You know. a spiritual experience, spiritual experience looks like ain't no laughing. That's why we laugh in these rooms, man. It's very important for us, man. You know, if, if you ain't having fun in here, you're going to try to go back and have fun out there. Man, I ain't never had it so good. I've had three valleys in my recovery. I'm so fortunate, man, and I'm so glad. You know, the last valley, and God is transformational. He's transformational, fellas. I don't care what it is that you're facing. Every year I go on my knees with a group of people. I've been fortunate enough in November 1987. You know, I owe my mom allowed me and my brother to open the doors of her house. And we had about eight alcoholics sitting around her dining room table with blue books open. And we started going through that book page by page, line by line. And we liked it. And we did what alcoholics do when they like something. We do it again. And after we went through <laughs> Chapter 7, you know, with that group of eight or 12, some people heard about it and said, we want to do it. And we did it again. And we did it again. And we've been continuing to do it since October, since November 1987. And we started at my mom's house, and we've outgrown that. And they'll be meeting in a couple hours in Los Angeles, meeting at the Never Too Early Big Book Workshop. And we open up, and now we have about 300 members to come. We show up with about 250 every, every Sunday morning. Been doing that every Sunday morning since 1987. And I've had the opportunity and the privilege to walk with men and women to see people put their lives back together, to see the lights come on. It is no greater pleasure than that. You don't want to miss it. If you're missing it, and you ain't got to find your niche in Alcoholics Anonymous. You might not be the greatest sponsor. You might not be the greatest speaker. You might not be, but find your niche in Alcoholics Your niche might be one-on-one. -on -one. 
Your match might be greeting. Your match might be just being hell of a listener. You know, but find your niche in Alcoholics Anonymous, man. It's someplace in here for every single one of us. I told you, you know, um, and just and, and I'm gonna get out of here. And and I apologize, fellas. You know, on the off chance that somebody wants to thank me, I'm gonna have to be running out of here because I'm gonna have to get on a plane. But you guys have made my weekend. You know, I shared at the front end of this that for the last few years my fellowship has been carrying me. You know, I got married on this program some years ago, got all the way down the aisle, even got the I do out in the pictures to prove it this time. <laughs> I got a 17-year-old daughter at home that's never seen her daddy loaded, and one day at a time she never will. Here's the miracle. I travel all over, and I travel often, and I'll tell my little girl, Dad's leaving on Thursday. I'll be back Sunday or Monday. Never seen the flicker of doubt in that little girl's eyes like I wonder if Daddy's coming home. Daddy's always home. I don't do this by myself because I'm not a rock, but I'm a rock to her. I'm soft to me. I break. I make mistakes, and I fall down. But in my girl's eyes, that two-year-old daughter whose piggy bank I was going in, she's 29 years old right now. She's a practicing attorney in the state of California. Just like last night when Lynn was sharing. And her play daddy didn't put her through school. And her step daddy didn't put her through school. And her uncle didn't put her through school. The result of this fellowship in this program. For the last 25 Christmases, birthdays, every day in between, I was a this year daddy for my girls. And I get to look from both of them on a regular. This is my daddy and this is my hero. Mom is still alive and these six brothers of mine, we didn't kill her. Four of us made it to this program. A few years ago, that 20-year relationship had ended. Lost my home. Lost all my money. Felt fraudulent in my sharing and in my speaking. Thought I should let my sponsees go. God is everything and he is nothing. Every now and then I say to myself, Ralph, what you do see so loud, I can't hear what you say. I say it to myself. And I have been fond of saying God is everything. And then when you lose your money and find out how much you depended on it, you stand in a squarely again at another level of spiritual development. Okay, God, me and you, I guess I didn't really, I guess I didn't really believe it. You know, when that marriage is crumbling, you stand there. And I want to share something with you, fellas. You can grow in the valley. You can grow wherever you plant it. You know how they say that God won't give you more than you can handle. That's true, but sometimes life will. That's why you need God. That's why you need God. Tell you something about that. You know, and I, 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 I thank God for sp And out of that valley is where I got my latest sponsor. In the valley. In the valley. You know, and Bob Bazanz is a man that... Uh, Through his example, through his example, you know, brothers in here like Charlie, through his example, through his example, it's men in here from distance. Don Maloney, I had the chance to know about him through the example you guys do. I'm grateful to be in your company, man. I'm grateful that you've tolerated me for these 25 years. I'm grateful that you've grown me up. I'm grateful you put my feet on the path. I asked a friend of mine, 55 years sober, I asked Tom. I remember him talking, and he talked about the one thing he's found invaluable in all these 50-some years of recovery. And he didn't say conscious contact with God of his understanding. He didn't say taking all the people. He said one word. He said enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. God damn it, if it's supposed to be a program of attraction, make it attractive. Don't be coming up here, fellas. There ain't no easier, softer. Oh, hell no. Hey, fellas, somebody in here is thinking it looked bleak and it looked dark. You know, how many people think that they got money problems? Don't be tripping off that, fellas. This all year, we ain't broke. We just in between money. We just in between money. Huh? We ain't broke. We having a good time, you know, we having a good time. I had my old friend, he used to say, is it all right right now? Somebody in here is in a dark place right now, but is it all right right now? 
You got this long-winded brother in front of you. This other. Is it all right? Right now. Not next week. Not if she don't start acting right in two days. Right now. And every right now, it kept being all right. And I'd be on the other side, and guess what I'd be armed with? Experience. That's what all of us bring to the table. That's what make us uniquely qualified to be a service to each other. It ain't our knowledge. It ain't our information. It's our experience. Hard-won experience. You know, and ain't nobody interested in your successes. You know what, what I lean on for my sponsor, he's walked this walk, you know. And I'm here to tell you, you can lose a 20-year relationship and you ain't got a drink. I'm here to tell you, the IRS can come after you for 80000 you ain't got a drink. I'm here to tell you, you can sit up here, lose your house and lose your money in front of everybody, and you ain't got a drink. And I'm going to tell you the kicker to that. Not only ain't you ain't got a drink, you can be happy, joyous, and free in that. In that. <laughs> I didn't come here for that. I don't know where that came from, man. But thank God, you know, and, and I'm getting ready to get on for the three phases of my prayer life, and it mirrors the three phases of my spiritual development. First phase, almost all of us come up in here on it. Help me. Almost, un almost all of us are sitting in these seats on a variation of that prayer. Help me. Please help me. God help me. That came up in here on that. Phase two, give me. Grant me. Grant me the serenity. Grant me peace as I go from Phase three. To phase three, highest phase. Highest phase of development, not only in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I think in life. Use me. Use me. Forget the money and the rest. Yeah, that's easy to say, but I do not, don't get me wrong. If somebody want to break me off something, I'm going to take it. But um, <laughs> I'm not one that's taking a vow of poverty. You know, I'm not so no. But check this out. Money or no money, you know, what, how, how do guys like us trip off money anyway? You know, I told you, I came from the garage. I came from eating lemons off a neighbor's lemon tree. I had had some things. I lost some money. Come and go, fellas. But you know what don't? The fact that you didn't have an impact in somebody's life. Imagine that. People like us. People like us. Have somebody. I'm looking at this crew right here, and they're rolling with you. People like us. The lights that come on. I always wanted to be important and do something significant. And there are some lights that come on. We don't see the only lights that we light. Every time I go to a meeting, fellas, every time, we're doing it right now. I get to participate in some little boy or some little girl getting ready to have a hell of a mom and back in their life. Every time I go to a meeting, we really doing this right now. I get to participate in some family getting ready to have daddy come back home. Every time I go to a meeting, me and you, we doing it right now. I get to participate in some man or someone getting ready to have a hell of a, a mate in their life. Every time I go to a meeting, who wouldn't want to be part of a fellowship like that? I've always wanted to do something significant, and I've always wanted to do something important. I can think of nothing more significant, and I can think of nothing more important than being a participating member of the life-saving, life-changing experience that is Alcoholics Anonymous. Whenever anybody anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand AA to be there, and I'm for that. I'm responsible. Take it real serious. You'll never hear Ralph White say, I don't know why I'm sober. I know exactly why I'm sober. I get a blessing so that I can be a blessing. Recovery for me is a gift from God. What I do with my recovery, that's my gift to God. My name is Ralph White. I am an alcoholic. <laughs>